Thank you, Pascal. Thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, before I start, if anyone's interested in moving to London for a postdoc position, please get in touch um, to work on pack based learning. So, uh, <laughs> okay. um, so, what I wanted to do is uh, explore a little bit about um, the uh, learning the prior and how the prior is set in pack based learning, and uh, particularly this idea that uh, we can set the prior by um, in terms of the data generating distribution, given that uh, you know that that's actually kosher, even though you know it somehow looks like it, you're cheating, and it's a, an idea that uh, Olivier Catoni um, uh, pioneered. But what I'm going to talk about is maybe ways in which this might be implemented in in, in practice. But uh, also, I think it kind of points uh, forward to. Um, what I might say is a sort of third way of looking at generalization of uh, classifiers. And I notice there's a lot on sort of pack based learning for, for deep learning, which, which is great. And I sort of feel this might point the way, and maybe people have already done it, so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm behind the. Uh, but the, I think I wanted to sort of highlight that, you know, when, we, when first people started looking at generalization analysis, they thought about a hypothesis space, and you tried to sort of bound the complexity of that space, and then you sort of looked at, uh, you know, generalization bounds in terms of your empirical loss versus the complexity of that space. So you had the VC dimension or something like that. And that actually, you know, was great for some cases, but broke down when you came to support vector machines in which the hypothesis space was too complex. So there was sort of the next generation which looked at somehow measuring something about the uh, the learned function, in this case the margin, that gave you some, you know, so you know that in theory uh, by the sort of lower bounds of the VC dimension that you could be in a bad situation and you may not be able to learn. So you had to look for some sort of indication that actually it wasn't that bad. You know, this idea you were lucky <coughs> and indeed the margin was an indicator that you were in a good situation, benign situation. and you could get good generalization despite learning in a very complex space. So there was sort of, you know, this idea you... And uh, what I would like, what I hope I'll be uh, able to sort of show is I think there's another sort of indicator in, in this way of viewing the pack based bounds that uh, shows a different type of insight that can show how we actually do learn in these very complex spaces. Um, and possibly might be applicable to deep learning. So that, that's sort of the overarching idea. But I really um, wanted to sort of, well, this is maybe just a little bit of that uh, motivation, renewed interest in, in stability. Um, so stability is the thing that will allow this connection to be made uh, that has been applied to stochastic gradient descent in training deep networks. And uh, I'll sort of come back to the stability analysis that uh, Bousquet and Elisiev uh, made uh, many years ago in application to, to kernel methods, and, well, and more generally, but uh, it's an inspiration for what I will be showing. And uh, the key sort of idea is this link between stability and data distribution priors that could point the way to further analysis of stable learning. And I'll make this sort of uh, carry this through for SVM weight vectors um, that, you know, will be able to show that the stability of those vectors can translate into this kind of data distribution prior bound that uh, I think is, is, is quite an interesting approach. Um, so it gives tighter bounds on the data distribution defined prior. And, uh, but anyway, I'll begin by reviewing pack base. So again, apologies, because it's going to be the same stuff that you've seen probably several times, but just to get as uh, as Yevgeny said, just to get the notation straight. Um, so I'm going to use different notation, sorry. Uh, so there's a set of classifiers. If I can get this pointer to work for me. There it is. Uh, C with a prior distribution and then a posterior distribution, Q. Um, the prior distribution must be chosen before learning, and the bound holds for all choices of the posterior. Um, and uh, certainly the Q does not need to be the classical Bayesian posterior. So I think one of the things that's really nice about the pack based bound is that it 
or Pat Bay's analysis, is it kind of takes the angst out of the Bayesian approach where you have to believe in your prior. Here you don't have to believe in it. It's just a choice you make. And uh, uh, you don't have to be sort of constrained by the choice of the posterior. You can choose it however you want. Um, and so this gives you a lot more flexibility. And uh, uh, you know, I'll talk about one more piece of flexibility that you're allowed because of the fact that you actually don't even need to know what the prior is. <coughs> in terms of being able to write it down. Um, so the bound holds for all choices of the prior, but you have to make the choice before you see the data. Um, but obviously, the quality of the bound may depend on the quality of the choice of P that you make. Um, OK, it's frequentist style. So there's another distribution, which is on the, uh, on the input space, the, or the cross product of input and output space. Um, and we generate. Uh, samples IID according to that distribution. And uh, then we have the generalization error that we're interested in, which is the probability, in this case I'm thinking of classification, so probability of misclassifying a, a randomly generated test point. Uh, and that's the thing we're interested in bounding. And then there's the empirical error, which is the empirical version of that. Um, However, we're actually not thinking necessarily of a single classifier, we're thinking of a distribution of classifiers. And uh, so the performance we actually bound is when we generate uh, for a test point X, we generate one of our random, one of our classifiers according to the posterior distribution and return that value. And uh, so we're interested in the true error of that, uh, um, of that procedure. That's the error, the generalization error and the empirical version of that error. Uh, and we can bound the, um, the error of the, um, the average that we, you know, if we take the average inside, as it were, then we get at most twice the thing that we bound. So this is what you might call the, you know, the, the thing that the Bayesians would do, the, the average. Um, so this is the bound. I'm not going to do any derivations at, uh, much in this, in this talk, but this uh, is one form at least, maybe not quite as tight as the one that Yevgeny put up, but it's uh, very similar. Um, M is my number of training samples, prior, posterior, empirical, true. And here I'm using K big KL in where, you know, that's an overuse of notation. Probably Yevgeny used the small KL, which would be better. We just think of it as a distribution on the possible error, errors of either making a mistake or not. Okay. <clears throat> so now I'm uh, in the case of uh, I'm going to focus in on um, support vector machines and uh, think about the standard approach, which is to have a prior at the origin and posterior distributions, uh, all with unit variance. And then uh, we move the center of the posterior distribution to the, un the uh, weight in, a, in the direction of the, let's say, SVM weight vector with a scaling factor mu. W is normalized norm 1 and the scaling factor mu. And uh, so this is the prior. That's the weight vector. And we move some distance in that direction. And that's the posterior distribution. Um, so the bound holds for all posterior distributions so that we can choose mu to optimize the bound. And we end up with, uh, with this expression, <coughs> where this is the uh, the proxy for the empirical error, which uh, I will describe briefly, but this is the KL divergence, which is basically the uh, mu squared over two, because mu is the scaling factor of the weight vector. And so mu is sort of acting as a trade-off between some uh, quantity here, which is growing with mu, and this quantity, which is potentially reducing with mu, because it increases the margin. So it's sort of factoring in there. And I've used KL to the minus one to effectively uh, express the fact that we have to solve this uh, equation to find QD. So we know Q hat S, we know uh, uh, KL divergence between these two, and we need to work out a bound on QD. So that's what I mean by KL to the minus one there. Okay. Okay, so that's all standard. So the question, so I want to now focus in on this idea of uh, learning the the prior, and I'm first going to do it from data. So I'm going to look at the, some of the bounds that you get through actually uh, using part of the data to fix the prior. 
So if we could fix a better prior, we can reduce that, potentially that uh, KL uh, factor, the mu squared over two, and make a tighter bound is the, is the idea. So we learn the prior with part of the data and then use the learned prior in the bound and they compute the stochastic error with the remaining data. So here we maybe train on R training examples, get some weight vector WR. We then uh, put the prior at some scaling factor in that direction. Uh, we then have our trains W, same as before, on the whole of the data. And we choose again, sorry, that mu, there should be a different <coughs> factor. That's uh, an error there, but you can imagine two different scalings. <coughs> and then you will have uh, now a KL divergence between these two, which is likely to be smaller than this distance here. Remember the KL divergence, just the distance squared. So the new bound will be proportional to that. Um, so uh, the fact, this is the new, uh, this is the thing we're interested in bounding, the true performance. This is the empirical error, which is now the empirical error note on the remaining examples, not the R that were chosen to do the prior, because that would be, uh, that would be cheating. Uh, this is now the difference, rather than the KL before, which was just the norm squared of mu w, squared, w it's now the difference between the prior and the posterior. I say eta and mu are the two scaling factors. Uh, and uh, the, we divide by m minus r because we only have m minus r genuinely uh, training examples in this sense that are not contaminated by being used to, to find the prior. Okay. Um, we can do better if we actually use the, we optimize this bound, and this would be something like an adaptation of the SVM where we actually optimize the bound um, that, that I wrote down there. Um, and we can apply the bound just as a standard SVM, but it makes sense to try and optimize it. And uh, these are the quantities, and we do again a linear search over mu. Um, and what we do is to el elongate the prior in the direction of the WR vector, which was the direction that was defining the prior. Um, so we actually have no longer, we have a sort of rugby ball uh, prior. Um, and the optimization then is really uh, n ignoring movement in that direction. We're sort of saying we don't mind how far you move in that direction. All we're going to cost you is how far you move away from that line defined by WR. Um, and then the posterior is, uh, again, a, a ball at the point uh, W. Uh, and if you plug it all in, there's a sort of uh, one parameter you have to put in which in order to make this bound, but it, it's really benign. Um, so the, and what it does is effectively factor down, this tau can be chosen quite big to really factor down the cost of this, you know, extension in the direction of WR. And you really only pay for the perpendicular direction, which is how far away from that initial prior direction you are. And there's some slight small cost here. So again, you know, this is quite, quite nice in terms of the, the way in which you... Uh, and so here's a comparison of some of the the, the uh, numbers that come out in terms of the bound, but also in terms of doing uh, um, the model selection and comparing with cross-fold uh, uh, cross-validation as Evgeny was doing in, in the previous talk. Uh, again, for some UCI data sets as Evgeny was doing, and uh, we were again selecting C and the, the kernel width. Um, and uh, we, we were using cross-validation to select the one with the minimal valid validation error and uh, doing pack bays and prior pack bays, this new, new approach to select the pair that would minimize the bound. And uh, so here's, here's some, some results. Uh, so <coughs> the bound is here and the, uh, this is the um, generalization error. Um, and uh, so Obviously, for cross-validation, we don't have the bound. This is twofold, tenfold. Um, interestingly, the bound sometimes, and for for instance, a standard pack approach, um, pack bays that is, um, are weak compared to some of the bounds that we get with these more sophisticated approaches. But the uh, 
model selection appears to be working better. So there's sort of a paradox that we've refined the bounds, but we don't actually get better cross-validation um, necessarily. And, uh, but the bounds are, are still, you know, really uh, quite tight, uh, not as tight as Yevgeny's, by, by, which looked amazingly tight. Um, but uh, still, you know, the performance is, you know, it is actually doing better sometimes than cross-validation in the selection of the correct model. Um, typically, it does slightly worse, um, but certainly comparable, nothing, nothing too bad. Okay, so that's just to show what can be done by learning the prior from data. That wasn't the focus I really wanted to make. I'm going to move on now to uh, looking at this idea of defining the prior through the data generating distribution. So this is an idea, as I said, pioneered by uh, Olivier Cotoni. Um, and he looked at these two distributions <coughs> where he defined the prior in terms of the uh, Gibbs distribution for the true risk and the posterior with the uh, Gibbs distribution for the empirical risk, which, uh, you know, is could be argued is probably the best thing to do. <coughs> and you end up with a, a, a really interesting and very tight bound. I, you know, this is slightly reformulated, perhaps to make it more interpretable for statistical learning theory, you know, notation, but uh, basically is, is the bound that uh, derived from the bound that he obtained. But what you see is we're no longer having a one on M bound. This is a, well, there's a, a one on M to the three over two, uh, one on M squared factor here. Um, there's a, this parameter gamma, which, okay, it's not clear how, but it can be chosen quite small, it, even for complex classes. And the only one on M factor is relative to this, which is just the log. So a log one on delta factor uh, with the root M. Okay, so, so it's really, you know, a much tighter bound. So, but this isn't really very easy to work with if, um, if you are thinking of, you know, infinite sets of hypotheses like the SVM. So what I'd like to do now is sort of try and see if we can take this idea and apply it in more, um, in ways that we can actually compute with them more, more easily. Uh, so let's try something pretty simple to motivate the idea. Let's say we just take a Gaussian prior uh, centered at this weight vector, which is, uh, you know, sort of a bit like a pars and window classifier. You know, we just take the expected value of, uh, of the positives minus the expected value of the negatives. That defines a weight vector, and that's our, our prior weight vector direction. Okay. <coughs> now, that's all well and good. That sounds maybe a good, maybe not. We don't know, but uh, it sounds a reasonably sensible thing to do. Of course, we don't know what that is. We don't know where that vector is. Um, we can only get an estimate from it from our training sample. Um, but the important point to note is that this is a, a vector that is fixed before we see the training data. So it's, it's a kosher place to place the prior. So it's fine. Um, now, in order to actually apply the bound, we will need to bound the KL divergence between this distribution, centered at this point, and the posterior distribution, which we will choose based on the training data and so on. Um, so we need to be able to estimate that KL divergence. The fact that we don't know where this is may not matter, provided we can estimate the KL divergence to that, to that point. And this is where I'm saying, you know, this is different from uh, a Bayesian who would need to know that prior uh, distribution in order to do uh, any of the updating of the uh, distribution to give the posterior and so on. But in the pack based case, we don't actually need to know this. We just need to be able to bound a KL divergence to this distribution. So what we can compute is an empirical version of this. But uh, now we need to, so we could, you know, estimate the KL divergence between this vector Oh, sorry, this distribution and the posterior, but we're missing this uh, distance here between these two vectors. So we need to estimate that, and I believe Olivier gave a talk about this kind of thing earlier, but uh, I'm going to present a slightly simpler uh, analysis which can bound this dis difference, so it's basically an empirical mean compared to a true mean, um, and we can bound it in terms of uh, the 
in a, in a dis sorry, a dimension independent way, where R is the radius uh, that contains the um, the uh, support of the distribution uh, that generates the data. So R, you know, if you're using a Gaussian kernel, R would be equal to one because the uh, data is normalized in the feature space. Um, M is the number of training samples, and this is holding with probability 1 minus delta over 2. So the proof relies on the independence of the examples and the fact that the vector is a simple sum. So it's a kind of uh, permutation argument and uh, estimating the, uh, the norm. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to go into the detail. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old uh, result. Um, and uh, so... But using this result, we can now bound the KL divergence between uh, the prior, which we don't know where it is, uh, based at this uh, vector WP, and our, let's say, posterior distribution Q, again, uh, isotropic Gaussian centered at W, is just the norm squared distance between, sorry, it's the square of the distance, uh, which we bound by the distance between W and this W hat, uh, and this bound on the distance between W hat and WP just by the triangle and inequality. So there you know, we have it, and we plug it all in, and that's the resulting bound that we get. And notice again, you know, we're getting this uh, M over uh, 3 over 2 coming in, plus this, which we're hoping is significantly smaller. So this is sort of factored down. This is hoping is significantly smaller because of maybe it's a good choice, WP. And, uh, and so this looks like it might be. However, the results are not good. Um, I, I, you know, this is, these are the two extra ones that make use of this bound, and they're all weaker than these ones, which are the, from the previous uh, approach of training on part of the, part of the data. OK, so this, is, uh, this was actually uh, somewhat older work. But uh, more recently, I've started to look at, could we do uh, a slightly more sophisticated analysis and use the um, a prior centered at the uh, expected value of the weight vector delivered by the sport vector machine algorithm on a randomly generated training set. So we fix the size of the training set, let's say it's M. We imagine taking uh, you know, a random the expectation over random samples of size M of the weight vector that you get from a, uh, a support vector machine. And I'm, I'm kind of taking this approach that's from Bousquet et al. when they did their stability analysis. They used this weight vector, which was the argument of this kind of pretty well standard. I'm thinking of hinge loss here and you know, the standard kind of approach. Um, so this, again, uh, is independent of the sample, so it's a kosher prior. Um, uh, but we don't know what it is, of course. Uh, so again, we have this problem of bounding uh, this to our uh, generated weight vector. Um, so, the, uh, so this is really what we need to do. We need to bound the distance between the particular uh, between the particular function, uh, weight vector that we get from our training set and the expected value that we would get uh, were we to take um, you know, the expectation over all possible samples of size M. And uh, we're able to bound this by this quantity here. Um, so it looks somewhat similar to that previous slide. And indeed, the proof is somewhat similar. Um, so the basic approach is you first use McDiamids to show that this is concentrated, but McDi McDiamids inequality, and that follows from Bousquet et al.'s results. Uh, and the next step is to uh, bound this uh, expectation of this quantity. Um, and uh, the idea is to try and use the same idea as in the previous proof of the concentration of the the uh, average of a random vector, um, the average of a sum of random vectors. Um, however, it's not so easy because the, uh, it's not just an average that they're weighted according to the dual variables. So the dual variables of the support vector machine weight the 
uh, components in that uh, sum that create this uh, weight vector. So you think of this weight vector as a sum of the, uh, you know, of the support vectors weighted according to the dual weights. Um, so it sort of begins to look like a sum of random vectors, but the, you know, the, the actual coefficients are depending on the particular sample. So the idea is to actually uh, imagine taking the weighted sum that you would get if you took the expected value of those dual parameters over all training sets, and then showing that actually that will give you a weight vector that's pretty close to this weight vector, surprisingly, and, or, but then, because now that is a weight vector with a fixed set of coefficients, you can apply the same approach as I was describing uh, for the random sum of random vectors. Uh, so you observe the SVM weight vector has a dual representation as a sum. The dual may vary, but you can bound the sum of expected values of the dual variables, and you can show that this sum is close to the true SVM vector. So what you end up with is... Uh, the KL term, uh, a bound for which the KL term is 1 on m squared with probability 1 minus delta, you get this uh, expression. Uh, so 1 on m squared here. Um, but that's a little deceptive because this lambda is the regularization parameter and so uh, it's, uh, it's going to be reducing that somewhat. Um, however, if we compare with the Bousquet bound, which was using this kind of approach, we can see that there is, this does look uh, significantly tighter, though it's quite difficult to compare because it will depend on the error rate in the way that uh, 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 Evgeny was showing. Uh, you know, for high, low error rates, uh, this will certainly be better. For high error rates, it might start to be, you know, comparable. But certainly, it's a, it, I think it's a, an interesting addition to the, to the uh, bounds arsenal. Um, so, the cost of the generalization is, exp so the, key, the, the, the really interesting thing here is that we're now seeing that we're bounding, you know, the bound actually depends on the difference between the weight vector we get from an empirical sample and the, uh, the mean of the weight vectors that we would get on over average samples. So, it's the concentration of the, where we end up in weight space that really matters not how big the whole weight space is. Um, so it's the expected difference between the average weight vector from random training sets and the specific training set. Um, so I think this, you know, suggests that we may be able to learn in very flexible spaces, you know, such as those in, used in deep learning, provided we can show that the weight vectors we end up with are concentrated around an expected value. Um, so in the case, obviously, of, of deep learning, we've got many equivalent solutions due to symmetries in the architecture, so you might need to measure stability after some initial burn-in where you've broken symmetry and so on, so you're sort of heading for one area of weight space. But it's really the concentration in that area should be sufficiently... is really what's important. Uh, so I think, you know, this is a different sort of conceptualization of generalization from, I believe, both of the earlier types of thinking around generalization. So, uh, including, uh, in conclusion, um, I kind of had a look over in learning the prior of the distribution of classifiers um, and uh, initially looking at those generated by using parts of the training data and they were able to give, you know, really quite uh, interesting improvements in the quality of the bound, not always in the quality of the uh, model selection. Uh, then looking at this data distribution to find priors there's the ideal Gibbs-Boltzmann distribution that uh, Olivier uh, proposed, but I used a very simple one to motivate ideas, which didn't give particularly good results, but the expectation of the complete SVM, I think, is a, is a, is a more promising direction, uh, and it may also... Um, sorry, for complete SVM, use the st stability analysis to show that the weight vectors are concentrated around their expectation, which makes this uh, application possible and uh, maybe suggest that we might be able to extend the analysis to weight updates by SGD in deep learning. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you. So 
why is that so clear that you will have this concentration of your, uh, your uh, coefficient? So uh, I think in one sense it's easier because your weight update will be a sum of individual gradients. So in that sense, it does look like a random sum. The problem is that one update will affect the next update. Uh, however, part of the stability analysis that was uh, I alluded to at the beginning, you know, I think it was Recht uh, et al, was precisely bounding the amount by which you know those effects can. So it'll be it'll be difficult and messy probably, but I do believe. After an initial burn-in, you will be able to uh, potentially bound that uh, amount of deviation that you would expect. And once you've done that, then I think things would go through, potentially. So you, you, you suggest something like you use mapping on in a concentrated uh, Yeah, something like that. My feeling was that the core of their analysis was, and maybe I haven't looked at it deeply enough, but I, I felt that the core of their analysis was indeed sort of bounding the amount by which things could be, you know, uh, one update could affect the next, and the, essentially how much, you know, swapping them around would be. And once you've done that, it seems to me that you should be in a situation where, obviously uh, you need the initial burn-in, uh, because you need to be at the point where those changes will not be too... I think they sort of say, ignore the first half or whatever, and then, you know, after that. So then, you know, I would have thought that there should be a possibility. As I say, I haven't, you know, looked at this in detail, but uh, it, it kind of... I thought, I actually said to myself, I'll try the easy problem first, and it proves a lot more hard. <laughs> so I was pretty pleased to get this far, but yeah, absolutely. Thanks for asking and answering the question for me. I, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>